Hello, my name is Michael Byers and I'm the chair of the Salt Spring Forum. And this is the fourth in a video series that the Salt Spring Forum is producing in partnership with the TAI concerning COVID-19 and its impacts on various elements of our society. Today, I have the very great pleasure uh, to introduce you uh, to Alex Neve, uh, the Secretary General of Amnesty International Canada, and moderating him, Madame Justice Catherine Wedge of the Supreme Court of British Columbia. So thank you for joining us. And without any further ado, I give you Alex Neve. Hello, Alex. Hello, Catherine. So I'd like to begin by saying that uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to moderate the forum uh, discussion with you. Um, you've had such a distinguished career uh, as Secretary General of Amnesty International Canada. You've led delegations and missions throughout the world. You've appeared before parliamentary committees and UN bodies. And before that, you uh, worked as a refugee lawyer. And before that, you were a law student at Dalhousie. And looking to be an activist, however you could. So, so my question is, what drew you to Amnesty International? Well, it goes back to where you ended, law school. Uh, I, I came into law school, mid eighties, so not exactly yesterday, knowing that I, I wanted to use law for social change, uh, but I had no other more precise idea beyond that. And, and really probably could have ended up going in any number of different directions, depending upon what came my way. And in, in those days, Amnesty International, of course, was, was not an active online organization. It was all about uh, mainly community groups that met regularly in towns and cities right across Canada and around the world where activists would come together to plan advocacy events, uh, public awareness building, uh, would, would take action on particular cases of concern. And one day I saw on a bulletin board in the Student Union building a notice for the monthly meeting of the uh, Halifax chapter of Amnesty mm -hmm. International. I went, there was a great speaker, there was an incredibly diverse and dynamic array of members uh, from a whole variety of different backgrounds who were active uh, in the group at that time. And I was hooked, the activist was hooked by the Amnesty International model of even in the face of big daunting global problems that sometimes seem like they can't be resolved. Here's something meaningful and concrete you can do right now to take action on behalf of one person or one community and, and make a difference. That obviously was very energizing and inspiring, certainly in 1985, just as it is now in 2020. But the, the aspiring first year law student who was looking for ways to use law in a different way uh, for social change, as I said, uh, was certainly very much uh, attracted as well, recognizing that while human rights violations are about many things, they're about history and uh, economics and geopolitics and culture and tradition and many other things. They absolutely are about law, good law, bad law, the need for more law, the need for less law, law that gets abused. And certainly uh, a first year law student was, was determined uh, that that was the direction for my legal career. And here we are, however many years later, 35 years later, um, as I say, there was no looking back. Well, and what an inspiration for law students now who think they may just be looking at Bay Street or Howe Street or wherever they are, to know that there are places that they can go to make a real difference. I. I frequently uh, reinforce that message with, I mean, sometimes I have opportunities to do it in a very formal way, addressing law school gatherings, etc., or just one-on-one -on -one exchanges, really highlighting that there are so many important ways uh, that law 
offers avenues for social justice. And, and while the pathways are not always as clearly defined as perhaps the pathway to Bay Street or House Street, uh, the, it is often through exactly what I'm just describing. It's the accidental encounters. It's, it's where you devote your volunteer time that, uh, that ideas open up, relationships are built, uh, connections with particular struggles and, and communities are forged. Uh, and from that, uh, some real awareness of, of ways in which uh, both your legal education and ultimately your legal career uh, can be used in very powerful ways. And, you know, so here we are now uh, in the middle of a pandemic and the topic you're here to talk about is, is the pandemic and its impact on human rights here and globally. And people might ask, though, isn't COVID-19 a public health issue or an issue concerning economic viability? So why are we having this discussion in the first place? I think that's absolutely the right first question to ask. And, and especially in the first few weeks of this crisis, I found it was a question that was being asked uh, quite frequently in media interviews, by members of the public, by government, uh, and for exactly the reason you've described it. Uh, obviously, this is a colossal concern, unprecedented challenge, but it's, uh, it's a public health matter, it's an economic crisis, what's human rights got to do with it? And our response back was there is no aspect of this crisis that isn't about human rights. Everything about the virus itself, a full frontal cruel attack on, on the right to health and sadly in so many instances the right to life itself. All of the manifestations of the economic crisis and, and the ways in which it is threatening people's uh, livelihoods and abilities to, to meet basic necessities, that's all about human rights as well. Those are enshrined human rights, the right to a livelihood, the right to food, the right to adequate housing, uh, etc. Those are all very much at risk. The ways in which the, both the virus and the economic crisis have particular impact on marginalized communities, raises real concerns about discrimination and equality, uh, which in many respects is one of the most fundamental tenets of, of the entire human rights system. And then we also, of course, have the, and this is, I think, where people ordinarily expect the human rights advocates to, to show up and, and be critics, um, the concerns about the fact that understandably and necessarily, governments are adopting measures, have adopted measures to respond to the health and economic crisis, which, uh, which lead to violations of other rights. Um, you know, freedom of movement perhaps being the most mm -hmm. obvious, border closures or the ways in which people are sometimes forcibly required to stay at home or encouraged to stay at home. Uh, those certainly are fundamental violations of uh, freedom of movement. All of the restrictions on where we can gather, how many people we can gather with, um, uh, which of course would even extend to you know, incredibly important rights around the ability to be out and, and gather for protest and freedom of expression, etc. All of that constrained. The international human rights system recognizes that that's um, not only is that permissible, but in some cases, even from a human rights perspective, may be necessary. Mm -hmm. But it also says to governments, this is not a carte blanche. Uh, you don't get to do this forever. You don't get to just violate any and all rights, no matter what. There are very careful uh, restrictions on restrictions of rights. And so there, the more standard human rights advocacy role of, of being there as a watchdog, as, as being there as, as a force that will be scrutinizing government action. And yes, pushing back when governments go too far, and we're certainly seeing mm -hmm. that right around the world. Uh, that's another very key aspect. So a whole host of ways, no matter which way you look at this crisis, there's a human rights dimension that needs attention. Interesting. Okay. Now, at the moment, um, as a result of the pandemic, um, and the measures that have been put in place, there have been a lot of discussion about the comparisons between the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, which <clears throat> of course followed 
so closely on the devastation of the Great War. <clears throat> there have been numerous studies and books written about whether uh, the Spanish flu pandemic uh, was in some ways transformative of society, causing a shift in thinking about class structure, uh, the vast social inequities and inequalities, because of course the Spanish flu, as we know, affected so disproportionately the poor and the vulnerable at that time. So is there a transformative potential arising from COVID-19? Will it, for example, cause a fundamental shift in the way we house and treat our elderly, given the devastating impact of the virus on our elderly? Um, and in long-term care facilities and the disabled, how we treat the elderly and their caregivers, how we treat the poorly paid workers who are now the ones seen as essential and who are on the front lines uh, as a result. So to make a long question longer, forgive me, what will it take to ensure this pandemic is truly transformative, that there will be a fundamental shift in our society and the way we look at things. Uh, well, I'll begin by agreeing with the premise of the, <laughs> of the question, which is, you know, should this, can this be transformative? And uh, 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 absolutely it can and must be because uh, for exactly the, the reasons you've just outlined very eloquently, it has laid bare so much that is ugly and inequitable uh, in society. Uh, certainly some of those issues around, uh, around the elderly in particular, uh, I think have really scandalized uh, a lot of Canadians. There's, there's whole hosts of, of um, uh, health professionals and families, etc., across the country, who have known that reality for a long time, but but now the entire country uh, is aware of it, um, and, and these inequities are are not only fundamentally unjust. Of course, what we've seen, and this is a this is a, a fundamentally important human rights message, is that inequities for for one community uh, inevitably have have impact and consequence uh, much more widely as well and, and yeah. it's especially in the face of something like a pandemic which spreads uh, and spreads so readily and doesn't doesn't respect borders and um, and and doesn't respect class structure uh, that we've that we've seen the ways in which we're all so fundamentally interconnected and linked up so with all of that in front of us, if this doesn't become that transformative moment, it's, it's to the disgrace and shame of all of us. And it isn't going to happen unless we all make it so. We uh, who are concerned about this, we who are determined, as we must be, that there will be transformation coming out of this, can't just sit back uh, and hope and expect that our governments, our business leaders will, will make those kinds of changes and transformation. We need to be part of setting that agenda, laying out those expectations, mobilizing and taking action. And I think we all know human nature is what it is. The window of time within which we will still have that raw attention uh, from the public uh, which which will make that kind of transformation possible will not be a long one uh, and uh, and we will need to 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 work diligently and quickly uh, to make sure that that agenda is set and and that we're even starting to set the agenda now um, as we're starting to maybe see a glimmer uh, of coming out of this phase of the crisis uh, and and make sure that this is very much on the table so <clears throat> I can't just sit back and say, oh, the human rights activists, I hope, will keep, you know, th keep this moving. Um, I and every other citizen has a responsibility to bring their concerns to the table. Is that? 
I think that's absolutely it. And I think we also have to recognize that, you know, transformation is transformation. We're not talking about, we just need some law reform, we just need uh, a different kind of uh, funding program for this or that. Uh, transformation inevitably means um, that we will have to transform ourselves as well. So I don't think we should be expecting any of us that, you know, the new normal is going to be the old normal with a few enhancements. Um, you know, going back to your, your particular example of you know, the scandalous revelations of, of how profoundly exploited and underpaid uh, some absolutely essential professions uh, are in our society. Uh, well, there we're talking about um, you know economic balancing, uh, you know redistribution of wealth, perhaps mm -hmm. uh, from a strong human rights perspective. I'm not talking about a political agenda mm -hmm. here, um, and and that has suggestions that you know those of us who have perhaps had the good fortune to live in much greater privilege uh, need to recognize that it's that it's time to perhaps give up some of that privilege. Uh, for very sound and profoundly important human rights reasons. I don't know yet what the answers are as to what this transformation looks like. Uh, and it's not only the human rights activists who need to be at that table, economists need to be, um, communities uh, need to be uh, at that table uh, contributing to those discussions. But it needs to happen in a meaningful and robust way, and it needs to happen quite quickly. Well, and it seems to me that it, it also, I mean, you look at the trade union movement and how um, it has fought for some kind of pay, um, proper pay distribution, um, and yet still we are fighting against the kinds of wage inequities that carried the janitors, that street cleaners that grocery clerks all face. And so I take it you, what, what you're saying is that, you know, we all have to now look at how we're going to shift uh, this paradigm. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely it. And, and have to recognize that we're not observers to that shift. Yeah. Maybe that's kind of the okay. important message I'm trying to convey here. Yeah. We all need to be part of the shift. Um, and you know, I'm not, 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 not that any of us necessarily at this point know exactly what that means. Mm -hmm. You know, it's much, you know, to, to draw an analogy to the other, you know, big global crisis we face, uh, the global climate crisis, which of course, you know, uh, sadly has, has slipped a bit into the back seat right now in terms of global consciousness, but is, uh, is still a huge uh, worldwide challenge. I think that's another example of one where, you know, bit by bit, more and more people in society recognize that that's not, that's the solutions to the, the global climate crisis don't simply lie in us looking to others to fix it looking to government, looking to other parts of society, uh, that we all have to step up and be part of the solution. Uh, and I think the kinds of transformation um, to, to social structures, economic inequality, uh, that we need to see coming out of the, the COVID crisis are similarly something that is all about us. Well, and <clears throat> as you famously said, famously quoting someone else, there are no human rights on a dead planet. And so it's all part of the mix, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's, that was our, our previous uh, global secretary general yeah. you know, uh, sort of highlighting why it is that something like the climate crisis needs to be understood as a human rights issue. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's another great example, much like we began our conversation about, you know, really, is this about human rights? Well, almost everything of this kind of colossal impact that, that touches on our, our well-being and even our very survival, yes, absolutely, at the end of the day, is all about human rights. Right. Now, <clears throat> at the moment, as a result of the pandemic, there are measures in place that could well be affecting our commitment to the rule of law. And certainly, in, in my profession, we're acutely um, aware of that. Um, there are restrictions placed on our courts, <clears throat> human rights tribunals, provincial and municipal legislators, such that we risk losing the transparency that the rule of law is designed to protect. Um, 
is Amnesty working with our government to find some flexible measures to put in place to try to protect transparency in our governing bodies during this, epi this epidemic? <laughs> Yes, we absolutely are, and I, and I think this is crucial um, uh, for, um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, we know that in times of crisis uh, that the rule of law, uh, regard for human rights, uh, is always strained uh, and, uh, and, and more likely is, is, is very seriously imperiled. Um, crisis is, is a time when the public uh, often is, is much more willing to give over to governments without without some of the kind of public um, uh, you know, skepticism that, that, that may serve to keep uh, governments in check. Um, it may be more difficult for journalists to be able to do some of their work and probe mm -hmm. and get full information. Um, certainly in this particular crisis, the decisions, uh, the programs, the funding that governments are rolling out is happening almost at the speed of light, certainly by government standards, mm -hmm. uh, such that the the, the opportunities for deliberation and consultation, which uh, which in the best of times should be there in a very positive way, aren't happening. Uh, and then, as you highlight, um, a lot of the bodies which we would normally expect to be playing a, an oversight, enforcement, transparency role from courts and tribunals through to our very government structures are suspended, scaled back, etc. So what does that mean for human rights and the rule of law in that context? Um, is, is, it, is it good enough for us to generally feel like, um, as, which I think is the case in Canada, but you know, government's hearts are in the right place. Governments know mm -hmm. uh, that they have to be acting to alleviate hardship and, and certainly to address the virus and, and, and all is good. Um, and I think from a human rights perspective, uh, the answer is no. Uh, Oversight and transparency is always important. So what do we do about it? Uh, uh, given, given all of the limitations, given the ways in which things are scaled back right now. About two or three weeks ago, we spearheaded an initiative which got tremendous support mm -hmm. across the country. Uh, about 150 organizations and, and 150 academics and individual experts all signed on to it, urging governments to take urgent steps uh, to enhance oversight uh, right now, recognizing that it has to be done flexibly and quickly. Obviously, this isn't a time to create complicated mm -hmm. new institutions that will take two or three years of law reform. Uh, what we've urged uh, is that, and this is at all levels, federal, provincial, territorial, and at municipal level, uh, for governments to establish what we've called human rights oversight committees, you know, broadly made up of, of the right experts, but also uh, representatives of, of some of the most impacted communities, to serve that function, to be there to do some monitoring, uh, to therefore, yes, um, you know, chastise and criticize if there are concerns to be highlighted, but also, very importantly, to be playing a positive role to be a, a body that will be able to point it out to government what is being missed, going back to that human rights message of who's being left behind, uh, to highlight those communities or communities within communities um, and what kinds of measures are needed to do something about that. Uh, we're getting um, some very positive indications so far uh, from the federal government that they are interested in putting something in place. Uh, we're having some very encouraging discussions with the Department of Justice in particular. Um, we haven't crossed the finish line yet. Uh, we don't know if it is really going to take off, uh, but there certainly is agreement that this is something that would be helpful. And just as a one last point here, I think it also goes back to something we were talking about um, a couple of questions ago around sort of the longer term transformative agenda. Uh, this body uh, would be an incredibly important resource to governments in helping to start to identify what that longer term agenda needs to be. Uh, and also how to craft it and move it forward. So it's a it's a process that would have both immediate short term benefit in, in responding to what is happening, you know, today and tomorrow, in the midst of the crisis. But it also would have a slightly longer term you know, visioning role in helping us figure out where we need to go next to improve human rights protection. Great. So Alex, uh, various people, various citizens have written in. Um, asking 
questions that they're hoping you'll be able to answer um, about this topic. And the first one is there's talk of a passport system of sorts in many countries where those who are deemed to be immune would give codes like in China or some identification that would allow them free movement. Are we wise to give up more privacy in exchange for that protection? Uh, yeah, there is. Uh, the, the questioner is quite right. There is a lot of talk about that and you hear about it being related to you know, that you could gain your passport in two different ways. Uh, number one, you're tested and you turn out to be one of the lucky few who, who has immunity, whether it's because you just naturally have it or or because you maybe had a mild case and you know, developed the antibodies and therefore have immunity, or um, you have been vaccinated and, and are in, once we have a vaccine and you're immune on, on, on that basis. Um, and that you would get the passport for one of those reasons. Um, that obviously sets us up for a pretty troubling world of you know, two classes of citizens, um, uh, some who are able to more fully and perhaps entirely participate in public life, um, and others who remain completely restricted from mm -hmm. the ability to do so, especially if we focus too much on those who have the good fortune, you know, by virtue of how they were born or whatever the case may be, to have the immunity naturally. You know, it's one thing once we reach a stage of widespread universal vaccination and can have that kind of confidence mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that everyone has the same ability and access to, to be able to have this, um, this passport or this permission to be back out in public life. So there's, I think, that dimension around it, which right. raises really serious human rights concerns about inequality uh, between, uh, between people. The other is, uh, yes, anytime we're talking about passports and passes and, and something that gives the government more and more ability to be gathering more and more information about you, um, there obviously are all sorts of concerns. We don't know how much private information about someone would need to be captured for, for one of these passports. We don't know what kinds of safeguards would be in place to ensure that that information is, is adequately, robustly protected and isn't going to be used uh, for, for other purposes. Uh, so there would absolutely have to be some real caution on that front as well. All right. Next question. So for a long time, particularly since 9-11, there have been voices pointing out that it would take very little for our most fundamental liberties to be taken away. And if all this takes is an extraordinary circumstance, like the pandemic, to override our rights, did we have them to begin with? Uh, well, I think uh, any crisis, and, and, and that's quite an apt comparison to remind us of the aftermath of 9-11 and, and to think about what's happening now. Obviously, two very different circumstances and, and the ways, the motivation, the manner in which rights are being restricted and or eroded differ, but, but that fundamental notion uh, is the same. Um, and, and I think this goes back to what I was saying earlier about why a human rights approach is so crucial at a time like mm -hmm. this, uh, because uh, one aspect is making sure that the restrictions that are imposed um, are, are going to be as narrow uh, as they possibly can be, and that they're not going to last longer than they're absolutely necessary. And that's always the risk uh, when extraordinary measures are brought in in a time of crisis. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of great writing and research that's been done to, to demonstrate that almost always in any country, uh, whether it be a dictatorship or a, a democratic country with strong rule of law institutions, when those kinds of extraordinary powers you know, enter the system in a time of crisis, they never completely disappear. The rollback is never 100%. And, um, and I think we have to be very vigilant uh, around that right now. I think we're still, in, as we're still in the midst of the crisis, there's still broad recognition, including largely from, from the human rights community, but not entirely, that there are some mounting concerns, uh, but you know, that we generally understand that the rationale for the restrictions right now is legitimate. Uh, but you know, will that still be the case two weeks from now, four weeks from now, six weeks from now? Uh, and, um, and at the end of this, 
uh, will we truly have uh, had rights fully restored? There's a lot to be vigilant about there. All right. Now, <clears throat> the next question is how might the Canadian healthcare system and the principle of equality of access be undermined by emerging guidelines prioritizing medical care for some groups over others, such as seniors and the disabled? And I, when I read this question, I think about the, the um, interview that I heard with uh, the CEO of the, of the cancer agency saying that there are so many individuals who need uh, their care now and, and, and those citizens are feeling as though they are, quote, expendable. Uh, I think this is perhaps one of the most poignantly painful aspects of, uh, of the whole human rights side of this crisis. Uh, and, and to highlight in particular um, the elderly and, and people living with disabilities, I think, really takes us to the heart of this. Uh, because, because we know uh, that's uh, absolutely been playing out uh, in the wrenching decisions that, um, fortunately, not so much in Canada, but um, in other parts of the world mm -hmm. where the numbers were massive, uh, and where the, the rise in those numbers was, was exponential in a very short period of time. Uh, and, and absolutely, some of those issues, whether, whether intentionally or unintentionally, around whether the elderly or people already with serious illness or people with uh, living with disabilities, quote unquote, did matter as much as others, did have the same entitlement uh, to health care uh, as others played out uh, day in, day out. I had a, uh, a number of weeks ago a very emotional um, exchange with a with a friend and colleague here in Canada, who's a who's a leading um, activist uh, in the disability community, uh, and you know she said to me, "I don't think people can appreciate the the emotional toll uh, this crisis is taking on us because we have the same fear." Uh, as everyone does, perhaps, that, you know, an accidental handshake or someone coughing in our direction without us being aware may mean that we suddenly contract the virus. But I don't think other Canadians worry, as we do, that when we arrive at the hospital, we might not matter as much as the person mm -hmm. sitting beside us, uh, because uh, whether it's intentional, and I don't think, I don't think she wasn't trying to suggest that we have health professionals who would intentionally yeah. uh, be disregarding the needs of a person with disabilities, but just that underlying feeling that because of the entrenched discrimination that has existed for so long, uh, that it's somehow going to play out. And that's exactly why the human rights approach and framework yes. matters so much now and why it has to be backed up to go to an earlier discussion we just had by some measures of oversight and enforcement um, mm -hmm. that, uh, that make it clear that good intentions and fine words uh, are never enough uh, to ensure that human rights are going to be fully protected. They're certainly not enough uh, in times of a volatile and difficult crisis uh, and that we need something that's going to back it up that will ensure uh, the elderly, uh, the woman living with disabilities, uh, that in the midst of this crisis, uh, they do matter as much as anyone else. All right. Now, the next question, it's, um, <clears throat> uh, it's been sent in anonymously, but it says, on Salt Spring Island, we have a substantial population of homeless people who congregate in a park in the middle of the village of Ganges. They don't practice physical distancing, despite being regularly urged to do so. Uh, do we have to tolerate the risk that these unfortunate people pose to our community? I know they have human rights, but where is the balance here? And I, I think that can be taken to all of the, you know, I think about Vancouver, um, the downtown east side, where people simply can't go anywhere to socially distant, distance themselves and so on. So, so where is the balance here? Uh, so I obviously don't know the situation on, on Salt Spring directly, but, uh, but this is a concern right across the country. Yes. Um, and, and I would broaden it, um, not only focusing on you know, the concern that you know, 
the homeless aren't doing what the homeless should do, mm-hmm. uh, I would broaden it to a wider concern uh, that, um, I guess at best, it's inconsistent across the country, and most of this plays out at the level of municipal governments because they bear a lot of the frontline responsibility around housing issues, uh, that it's been inconsistent the measures that have been taken to ensure that there is something in place uh, for uh, for homeless individuals. There is somewhere to go uh, that is safe and dignified uh, that will ensure that uh, that they can uh, physically distance, uh, like all of us are being required to do, uh, can do so uh, in conditions that, uh, that meet their other basic needs. Uh, we're starting to see that in some instances. Hotels have been taken over by some municipal governments are being made available. Uh, to the homeless, uh, but there's, I know, frontline uh, organizations working with homeless populations are still ringing the alarm uh, around this and are highlighting, uh, and this, again, this brings us back to sort of the connectedness and universality of the human rights concerns here, that uh, you know, fundamentally we need to be concerned about this because this means that homeless individuals who have the same right as you and I do, uh, are perhaps in greater peril and facing greater susceptibility to uh, to uh, contracting the, the virus, but also uh, that that means that they pose uh, a public health risk uh, to the rest of the population. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's all part of the same story. It's yeah. it, you know, one of the messages that we've been conveying as part of our human rights work uh, around the crisis is uh, none of us are safe unless all of us are safe. Um, and you can say, you know, none of our rights are protected here unless all of our rights uh, are protected here. And I think that's the approach we need to take to the concerns around homeless populations. All right. Uh, now, the next question is, uh, as a result of closing the Canada-U.S. border to non-essential travel, our government says it's returning all those who cross the border irregularly to from the United States without... <clears throat> access to refugee determination procedures that they are going to be sent back. Is this, and I, I don't know whether the question is really, is this legal in a time of emergency like COVID-19, but more to the point, is it necessary? Uh, well, I would say actually it's about both of those questions. Is it legal? And is it necessary? And absolutely the answer to both is no. This is in fact one of one of the several key concerns in Canada that Amnesty International has been very actively campaigning about. Uh, and that's because even before the COVID crisis, we have long-standing concerns about Canada's approach to refugee protection mm-hmm. along the US-Canada border. We have an agreement in place known as the Safe Third Country Agreement with the United States which even before COVID came along, says to refugee claimants who come to official border posts that they're not allowed to come into Canada to make refugee claims and must remain in the United States. And Canadian policy on that hasn't changed, even with uh, the rapid deterioration in regard for refugee protection in the time of Donald Trump in the United States. Uh, And then what we've seen with the border closure is that the is that the other avenue that was still open for refugees to be able to cross the border and access refugee protection in Canada, which was to cross the border irregularly and then turn themselves in and make a refugee claim to Canadian officials uh, inside the country. That's now uh, been shut down as well. And uh, and so to get to the question of legality, no, Mm -hmm. it is legal. Uh, That is a breach of of international law. Uh, in our view, it's actually even a breach of the Charter of Rights. Um, uh, it would take, obviously, many months and perhaps several years and go through multiple levels of appeal before we would have a final court ruling on that question, and we can't wait for that right now. Uh, but uh, but absolutely, in our view, it is illegal. Uh, but, but very profoundly, and I'm glad you asked the question about is it necessary, it isn't. And in fact, uh, public health groups have joined us, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders in yes. particular, uh, but a number of others um, have joined us in a public statement uh, and a strong message to the government saying, this is not only bad refugee protection, it's bad public health policy. 
uh, that the right approach, and this goes back to those earlier points about the fact that this virus doesn't know or respect borders, um, and, and none of us are going to be safe anywhere. Uh, until the virus has been eradicated everywhere. So the notion that all's good and all's safe if we just push that refugee mm -hmm. who might have the virus back into the United States and there it's gone away and will never have any impact for us. And, uh, and we'll just hope that maybe someone in the United States will figure out that they should do something about it. When we had the opportunity, when they made their refugee claim, uh, to use the same kind of self-isolation uh, or, or even more forcibly so, required isolation measures that are being used with respect to everyone else who crosses that border, including Canadian citizens who are coming back to the country. Uh, the 14 days uh, to, to identify if they do have the virus, mm -hmm. make sure it gets treated. If they don't, all is good, public health concerns averted, and we've upheld our refugee protection obligations. That's what Canada could and should have done. Mm -hmm. It's not what we have chosen to do. And it's particularly troubling because we're seeing right around the world, not surprisingly, that refugees are being uh, ignored, uh, are being scapegoated uh, in some countries, uh, and certainly that border closure measures being adopted all over the world uh, are completely violating these, these key rights around refugee protection. And Canada could have broken that mold. Canada could have demonstrated a different approach, uh, not an approach that is, that is negligent about the public health side of this, an approach that takes it very, very seriously, uh, but doesn't sell out refugee protection in the process. All right. So one last question. Um, looking forward, if an effective COVID vaccine is developed, would it be appropriate for governments to make that vaccination mandatory? Would making it mandatory <clears throat> raise human rights concerns? And I suppose that also takes us to things like uh, polio, the measles vaccine, things that have really uh, saved so many people, but. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, the, the, and this isn't ducking the answer, uh, but um, the, the real answer to that question does need to come from public health experts and professionals, because uh, yes, uh, I mean, obviously what is um, underlying the question is a sense that it would be a violation of human rights yes. to force individuals to receive to go through the vaccine if they do not want to, if they have you know, conscientious reasons for not doing it or, or other reasons. Um, and, um, and as I said earlier, uh, you know, human rights principles do recognize that there are times when it is legitimate for governments to restrict or contravene rights if there's a pressing <clears throat> public health, uh, public safety reason for doing so. Uh, and I think that's where we would need, it would come down to what the public health evidence is, how effective is that vaccine, uh, what are the implications if, if even a small minority or a significant minority uh, don't get vaccinated, does that mean, uh, and is there a difference between that and something like polio, which obviously, you know, the, the coronavirus spreads in a much more virulent, mm -hmm. um, uh, expansive way than something like polio does. So does that mean the equation uh, is different in terms of how we understand the validity of government intruding in people's freedom of choice and conscience and privacy in that way. So there's not an absolute answer, I guess. It would depend on, on what the science tells us about the nature of that vaccine um, and perhaps more significantly the impact and consequences if, um, if a significant number don't choose to take it. All right, thank you. Alex Neve, this has been a wonderful opportunity for me to uh, hear from someone of your stature and uh, someone who has done so much for human rights uh, in your time uh, with Amnesty International. So thank you very much. 
Well, thank you. Uh, I very much enjoyed the, uh, enjoyed the conversation, and uh, you know, even though I didn't get the benefits of, of a trip to Salt Spring, uh, it's been uh, it's it, it's been the next best thing to have this opportunity, especially at a time uh, where where human rights need to be so much at the forefront of how we're of how we're moving through. Uh, this crisis, but absolutely how we're going to move out of this crisis. And, And I'm glad we had the opportunity to explore all of those dimensions. Thank you.